Good morning, everybody. We're going to just wait a few minutes here and get all the attendees logged in. And we will get started with today's seminar. And they're still rolling on. So just a couple more minutes. Okay, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get rolling here. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first ever Community Council of Maui Zoom meeting. And before we get started today, <clears throat> I want to thank Atlas Insurance for sponsoring the seminar today. They have brought their technology and experienced speakers to present today. So thank you, Atlas team. And I'd like to take a moment, as usual, and introduce to you the Community Council of Maui Board of Directors serving you this year. Mila Salvador is our Vice President, Robert Miskay, Treasurer, Daniel Kornfind is our Secretary, Della Nakamoto, Newsletter Chair, Greg Gaudet, Membership Chair, Rebecca Filipovich, our Membership Chair, Chris Porter, Director, Marilyn Chapman, Director, and of course, Eunice Kunichige, our Administrative Assistant, and Tiffany Mancao, newsletter member, and me, Lisa Kano, serving as your president this year. Next slide, please. So we have a few housekeeping items today. If you haven't already sent in your questions, you may type them in the Q&A box on your computer screen. Placement of this box is dependent on each individual's computer settings. And Elaine G from Atlas Insurance will be monitoring that Q&A bar to ensure that all the questions are answered at the end of the seminar. So to get started today, water damage claims are challenging in many ways. So the panel presenting today will break down the process, explaining why we need an incident report and why it is so important to put your agent on notice of a possible claim. Being a property manager for 14 years, I can attest to the necessity of having an active, engaged insurance agent and also a professional vendor to mitigate the claims process. Management companies also play a crucial role in this and should encourage the boards to have a resolution for consistency in assessing the deductibles back. There are many ways that a claim can go sideways and Atlas is here today to educate us on this process. So now I'm going to turn it over to the seminar coordinator, Dawa Nakamoto. Thank you, Lisa. Aloha and good morning, everyone. I am your host, Della Nakamoto. I'm an account executive at Atlas Insurance Maui office. I've been in the insurance business for 23 years and am a member of Atlas's AOAO group. Our team handles over 300 associations in the state of Hawaii. One of the most common claims in a condo building is water damage. Today, we will cover the anatomy of a water damage claim. We chose this topic because we feel it is extremely important as our team members have spent countless hours in helping guide our clients through the process, which even though we've had so many seminars on it, 
continues to be a mystery to many of us. We have also seen where water, some water damage claims have resulted in lawsuits between unit owners and board members when a claim is not handled properly. Our goal today is to provide best practices procedures in handling a water damage claim to keep harmony between unit owners and board members to avoid expensive lawsuits from happening. Next slide, please. Today's agenda will cover the claim notification process, what to do, who to call when you experience water damage in your unit, the role of a remediation company and how important it is in the claim process, the adjustment process. We will actually have uh, actual claim scenarios for you the claim settlement distribution, distribution. We will go over the settlement letter from the insurance company, including assessment of the association's deductible. Um, once we've gone over the entire process, we will have some key takeaways for you. And finally, we will have time to answer questions for, for the, from the audience. So as Lisa mentioned, please type in your questions in the Q&A box. Next slide, please. Most associations that we work with have a claim handling process. Associations that do not have a claim handling process usually find out about the loss afterwards when they receive a letter from the HO6 carrier asking for reimbursement. So if you don't have a claim handling process, we hope that this seminar will help you create one. Let's get started with the claim handling process. Duties in the event of a loss. First, you wanna call a remediation company immediately. Second, collect information. Insurance companies usually look for date of loss, description of loss, you know, uh, what happened, how it happened, who, how many units were involved, and photos. So take lots of photos. Third, you want to complete an incident report right away while everything is still fresh in your mind. I thought I saw this picture. Um, fourth, provide a copy of the incident report to all affected units. And finally, notify insurance companies. Unit owners, you must notify your own insurance carrier and association, yes, association, you must notify your insurance carrier. And we will, we will cover that later in the seminar. One important thing that you need to remember is do not hold up the claim. Even if you don't have all of the information, submit the claim anyway, talk to your agent about it. And more importantly, and we've seen this many times, do not wait for the insurance company to assign an adjuster to come out to determine whether the loss is covered or not. The reason why that is, is under both the master and HO6 policy, there is a duties in the event of a loss under the loss conditions provision, which states that you, the insured, must take all reasonable steps to protect the covered property from further damage. So don't hold up the claim. Okay, so the loss has occurred. We've notified all relevant parties. The water remediation company is the first to arrive. The remediation company's role in the claim process is extremely important as they're there to stop the loss from further damage and do the bulk of the cleanup work. In this next step, you will learn what is done during the remediation process, how long it takes and why. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Anthony Nelson. Anthony is the president of Premier Restoration Hawaii, which operates statewide with locations on Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii Island. 
He has over 19 years experience in the restoration industry. Anthony is a master water restorer, master fire and smoke restorer, a BSI certified building thermographer, and is certified in in infection control risk assessment. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks so much, Stella, and thank you for inviting me to participate with everybody today. Um, this is such a great association to be a part of, and we've been members for a very long time, and it's always one of the events that we always look forward to, whether we can be together in person or staring at each other through computer screens. Um, next slide, please. So I want to start with a, identifying exactly what the process is for the different types of water events that we can respond to. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is category one or commonly referred to as clean water losses. And so what I did, I try to provide, a, you know, a, a guideline, a baseline for you as a property manager. If you have one of these types of events, what should you reasonably expect to happen and how long should it reasonably take? Um, so for category one water losses, the steps are pretty simple. Um, step zero, and I call it step zero because it's the first thing we do before we do anything is to identify and isolate the source of the loss. Um, we wanna know where the water came from and we wanna make sure that it's not coming from that source anymore. Um, step one, we'll go ahead and extract the free water. Um, when I train our technicians, this is what I impress upon them. Don't try to dry something that you can extract or remove. So the example being, if there was a floor that was affected that needs to be extracted, don't try and dry it, simply extract it. Um, perform necessary demolition. So any building materials that we know are not going to be salvageable through the process, we wanna go ahead and remove those first, get them out of there. It's one less thing we have to dry. Um, step four, we're gonna go ahead and monitor drying. So uh, that is setting up our drying equipment, the drying process, monitoring the building materials, making sure that everything is drying in accordance with our drying plan and returning it to equilibrium moisture constant, which is just fancy words for dry. Um, and then step five, we'll perform a final verification for category one water losses. We do that verification in-house. Um, and you can see in, for each one of the steps I've identified, you have duration in days. So step zero takes zero days, step one takes zero days. Um, performing necessary demolition takes roughly a day. A lot of the times it gets done in conjunction with the drying process, but for argument's sake, I built in a day. And then usually our average dry time is four days start to finish. So total run time of 72 hours, um, but it usually spans across four days. And then we're picking our equipment up, steaming everything dry and getting out of there. So an average of five days total time and process for mitigation of category one water losses. Next slide, please. So for category three or situations where there's microbial growth, you can see there's a whole lot more steps that we need to go through. So we're still gonna do step zero. We're gonna identify and isolate the source of the loss. Um, step one, we're gonna perform an initial knockdown with a disinfectant that's for the safety of the building occupants as well as our staff. It does a great job of just making sure that any contaminants that are in that water, we just go ahead and knock them down. Then we'll go ahead and extract free water. Um, usually then this is where the process gets more complicated. We'll establish containment. So the, the main thing we're gonna wanna do is isolate the affected areas from the unaffected area. And the main reason we do that is to prevent the unaffected area from becoming affected. Um, step three, we'll go ahead and stabilize the environment. We'll set up dehumidifiers, air scrubbing equipment to go ahead and make sure that the affected building materials aren't getting unaffected building materials wet and that any contamination that may be airborne is getting captured and not affecting adjacent areas. Uh, step five, get approval for demolition. You can see that I built in a healthy buffer of five days for that. A lot of the times we're working in spaces that are occupied, particularly even more so now with COVID, um, everybody's home. And when you show up and you say, hey, I wanna take out your kitchen, most of the time folks are like, all right, I gotta, I gotta figure out where I'm gonna go, or I gotta figure out how I can live without a bathroom, live without a kitchen, live without you know my daughter's bedroom. Um, and that, Usually it can take longer than five days, but just for argument's sake, I put in the five days. Um, step six, remove contaminated building materials. 
most of the time, the, the, the demolition side only takes about a day. Sometimes it can take a little bit longer, but you know, most condo losses, it's either kitchen, a bathroom, it's very rarely a whole condo that we have to, de to demo. So it's usually about a day. Um, step seven, we'll pressure clean and disinfect the affected area. And that's our step to remove the bulk of the contamination that might be present, whether it's a category three water loss. Um, we do skip this step if it's a mold loss because we don't want to introduce any more moisture into the environment. Um, once we've got everything pressure cleaned and disinfected, we'll go ahead and set up for drying. At this point, with the combination of stabilizing the environment, usually a little bit of duration around getting approval, um, things have started to dry out naturally, so it's a little bit easier to get them dry at this point. So three days for that. Um, step nine, we'll ver do our in-house verification to make sure that everything is dry. And then once we do that, we'll do our critical cleaning, which is, we, we call it a HEPA sandwich, but we'll HEPA vacuum. Then we'll wet wipe with a disinfectant then we'll have a vacuum again. And that's pretty common across both category three events and mold events. Um, and you'll also see that critical cleaning step in any sort of hazardous building materials abatement that we have to do. Uh, and that usually takes about a day. Step 11, um, we'll perform the post remediation verification. For us, this means contacting an outside third party. Um, I always akin it to the relationship between a doctor and a pharmacist. You know, the doctor writes the prescription, the ph pharmacist fills it. In this case, it, for us, you know, the, the doctor is the independent third party that comes in and checks our work and makes sure that we did everything the way that we should have. Um, that process can take three days. Now, it doesn't take more than a day to do the post remediation verification, but it can take some time to get the results, which is why I put three days in there. And then you have that last step of once we get the results, we have to go to the site, break down the containment, and get everything out of there. So total time in process for a typical Category 3 or environmental project is going to be about 16 days, which you can see is a far departure from a Category 1 water loss. Next slide, please. The important thing to know is a lot of Category 1 water losses become Category 3 water losses because Nobody picked up the phone and called a, a company to start drying right away. So your category one water loss, if left unattended, will degrade a full category per day until you start drying it. So if you wait up to 72 hours to call us, there is the possibility that your clean water job just became a category three water job. So I always tell everybody, um, don't ever hesitate to give us a shout. Even if it's something you're like, I don't even know, this is super small, if these guys are going to handle it, um, you know, we'll come out, we'll do the inspection, we'll go ahead and get you the information you need, so then that way you can make a smart decision and understand how to move forward for your property. Next slide, please. Um, so that was the mitigation process. There's also some other things that go into restoring a property. Um, so I broke them down into four basic categories, and these actually mirror the production divisions that we have within Premier. Uh, mitigation services is anything to get a structure clean, safe, dry, and odor-free. That includes drying, removal, cleaning, and testing. Um, contents is personal property, packing and moving personal property, you know, whether that's because a floor got affected and we need to move everything from the kitchen into the dining room so we can pull the kitchen floor to full-scale contents restoration, um, assembling salvageable and unsalvageable inventories for the purposes of insurance reimbursement. I've got a, we have a whole division that's dedicated to just contents. And the main reason for that is, is our mitigation technicians tend to be a little bit, you know, they're, they're fast moved. These are the guys that are drinking Red Bull and like getting the calls at 3 a.m. Our contents folks tend to be very detailed and tend to be the opposite personality type. Um, abatement, which is the removal of any hazardous building materials, um, both identification and post-testing. And a lot of the times our abatement services will overlap with mitigation if we've got asbestos containing drywall, asbestos containing floors, you know, lead paint. Um, we try and perform those services in conjunction, but we do have a separate division because the training is way more rigorous. Um, what you need to know is much different than the mitigation stuff. And then our final stage of restoration, reconstruction. So anything to restore the structure to its pre-loss condition. And then I always put in parentheses, 
or insured limit of coverage. Um, sometimes there is not enough insurance dollars to get it back to where it was, and we have to make some hard decisions with our customers to decide, you know, maybe we don't have the funds to go back with a granite countertop when we end up going back with a laminate countertop. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that I would want to know if I was a property manager is the different types of estimating that we do in property restoration. Um, you break them down to two, two different types. So the first type is unit cost, or a majority of these estimates get written in a software called Xactimate, a uh, pretty common platform. We use it. I know John Mullen guys use it. Uh, I, trying to, I can't think of an insurance adjuster that doesn't use Xactimate or a property restoration contractor that doesn't use Xactimate. The way that Xactimate works is it commonly uses a price per X model. So price per square foot of flooring removed, um, you know, linear foot of cabinets, detach and reset a toilet. And they give you a fixed price with that. And that assumes certain labor efficiencies. Um, we use it on a majority of our projects, 63% of space off of 2019. Um, and these typically tend to be smaller projects. Uh, the, it is fixed pricing. And what's really nice is it's fixed pricing based on the scope. So a lot of the times the conversations that we have with adjusters, property managers, unit owners is what's the scope? Because if we know the scope, the scope will dictate the price if we're writing an Xactimate. Um, What's important to know about Xactimate is the burden's on the contractor to perform and hit a margin. Xactimate tells us what the pricing is, and it, we go ahead and sum total that number and go, can we do the project for this, yes or no? And if not, then we start digging a little deeper. And there are inefficiencies in the price list. Sometimes it's wrong. Um, it's not a do, you know, it's not a, a, a definite price guide, but um, they do have some flexibility there. And the other thing that's important to know is it doesn't encapsulate any direct overhead or logistics. It presumes that every single project, uh, 20 cents of every dollar goes to cover your overhead and logistics. And this is usually wrong. I can tell you the, the burden to keep Premier afloat between truck payments and on-call centers and all of our support staff is actually much higher than 30%. Uh, the other type of method, uh, estimating methodology is called time and material uses labor material and equipment rate sheet. So this is the, the guys worked this many hours and there were four of them there and they used this material, these materials and this equipment to get it done. Um, this accounts for about 31% of our projects. These are usually larger projects, more complex, um, tend to be more multi-trade. And the one, the, the nice thing about time and materials, it does accommodate for those labor inefficiencies, you know, parking, traffic, waiting for elevators. A lot of the times these are tend to be a little bit more Honolulu centric than Maui centric problems, but Maui's not completely immune. Um, it, straight up, it costs us more dollars to service a project on the west side than it does in Kihei. Um, pricing is based mostly on resources and duration. And then what's unique about time and material is the burdens on the contractor to perform to a given schedule. So a lot of the times we'll utilize time and material pricing mm -hmm. and a building manager says, look, you got two weeks. And I go, okay, if you give me Xactimate pricing, I can't get it done in two weeks. But if we go time and material and I don't have the burden of having to know exactly what that price is and cost controls, and it's just about getting it done, then we can do it on a time and material basis and usually hit a given schedule. Um, we've done pricing analysis between Xactimate and time and material. And a lot of the times there's not a huge delta between the two methodologies. It's just time and materials easier to assemble on the fly. Whereas Xactimate, usually there's a delay associated with putting the estimates together. Um, and then uh, that time and material price list has a fixed margin built into it. So we make a given percentage off of every single line of service there. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to review some key considerations, and we'll probably touch on this in more detail in the Q&A, um, category of water and the date of loss, like how far back the date of loss is has a direct impact on cost and duration, as well as are there any hazardous building materials present? Um, also, any as-built versus betterments and improvements considerations, because the policies work differently for those, and Mike will go ahead and talk about that. Um, one of the things that the buildings very rarely worry about, but we're very concerned about is contents or personal property damage. You know, what, what does the unit owner have that got damaged? Is there a policy that covers it? 
um, particularly if those things are tenant occupied. Unfortunately, a majority of tenants do not have renter's insurance, and that's a huge problem for us. Um, accommodations to reduce adjusted living expense, simple things like can we set a temporary sink so then that way you can have your kitchen back while we wait for your new cabinets to come in. Um, and cost to salvage versus cost to replace, is it cheaper for us to remove this than it is to dry it? Sometimes in the long run, it's actually cheaper for us to dry it, but you get back in your unit a little bit faster and people are happier. And then any materials that have long lean times, cabinets, counters, et cetera. Next slide, please. All right, and at this point, I'm gonna to toss it back to Della. Thank you, Anthony. If you have any questions for Anthony, please do type them in the Q&A box. Okay, now that the restoration company has restored the unit, they will then provide their repair estimates to the insurance company. In this next segment led by Keen Moranaka, we will cover the adjustment process, how the adjusters determine what is covered under the master policy and what is covered under the HO6 policy. We will also go over the breakdown in the adjuster's settlement letter and how the association's deductible should be handled. I'd like to introduce to you Keen Moranaka, Senior Claims Consultant of Atlas Insurance. Keen brings over 25 years of experience in claims management. He has been instrumental in advocating on behalf of Atlas clients on tough claims to ensure claims are being adequately reserved and handled properly. Keen also monitors local and national court cases that are impactful to current and future claim settlements. Take it away, Keen. Thank you, Della, and good morning, everyone. In this next section, uh, we will give you two typical water damage scenarios. The purpose of this section is to show you what should be covered by the master policy and HO6 or the unit owner's policy. We will also show you show the deductible process and the decisions to be made by the association board in anticipation of handling water damage claims. Here presenting with me today is Mike Petruche. He is the property supervisor at John Mullen and Company. He has over 20 years of experience in the insurance industry. He has been with carriers such as State Farm and Erie Insurance Group. He has very extensive work background and well qualified with an alphabet soup of designations after his name. He works for the largest independent adjustment firm in Hawaii. John Mullen and Company has handled claims from all the local major uh, carriers in the state as well as many national insurance carriers. Their property unit are experts in the area of water damage as they deal with these claims on a daily basis for both the association and personal lines policies. We wanted to thank John Mullen and company for allowing Mike to be part of the presentation today. Next slide, please. So now let's go over the two very common scenarios where water damages several units. The only difference in these two scenarios is the cause and source. In scenario number one, the sink overflows in, in one unit flooding several other units. There is clear liability on the unit owner or the household member or the occupant for leaving the faucet running for several hours. In scenario number two, it is unclear as to what caused the rupture, but it is clear that the water line servicing services multiple units, therefore making it impossible to put the liability on a single unit. Here again, the loss floods multiple units, causing damages to the building and contents. The association deductible is the same in both scenarios, which is 5,000. The key issue will be how the association's deductible will be handled. That portion will be covered later on in this presentation. And throughout this presentation, you will hear Mike and myself referring, the, referring it to the AOAO deductible or the association deductible. They're both one and the same. 
At this point, we wanted to show you how the loss would be handled by the adjusters for the association and the unit owners and who should be responsible for the different components of the loss. Next slide, please. Mike, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Keen. We appreciate the opportunity to be here and help shed a little bit of light on this sometimes very confusing topic. Uh, so what we wanna do is just talk about the interaction and the roles of the adjuster in the, in the claims process when, when a loss happens. But first we wanted to just start with an, a basic understanding of what policy covers what, what the master policy covers versus what the HO6 policy is intended to cover. So we'll start with the, the master policy or the AOAO policy. And, and we'll talk in general terms about 99% of the time, there are a few exceptions to everything, but most of the time, the association, the master policy is intended and written to cover what's called the as-built condition of the structure, in addition to the mitigation that's necessary. The governing documents of the association will sometimes refer to it as original conveyance, um, but either way, it's, it's the, the common term that you would hear most often is going to be as-built condition. And the as-built condition is, is exactly that. It's how the building was constructed originally when it was handed over to the association and to the first unit owners. Uh, this is, it's important to understand that because it does play a role in which policy covers what in regard to the HO6 and the master policy. So in the governing documents, that is typically outlined in an what's called the insurance section. There's typically a, a, a whole paragraph or multiple paragraphs dedicated to what the association, what type of insurance the association is required to get and obtain on the building. So the as-built again is the way it was originally constructed. Now, over the years, unit owners are gonna come in and purchase the unit and they're gonna do some upgrades. Next unit owner may do some things. So it's important to understand that it's not, the as-built condition is not how the unit was purchased by that current unit owner. It's how the building was originally constructed. So if it dates back to the 60s or 70s, typically it's going to be carpet in the living areas, vinyl in the, the kitchen and bathroom, laminate um, countertops, just kind of basic construction. Um, it's also important to understand what it does not cover. So it does not cover, the master policy does not cover any of the unit owner upgrades, any of the unit owner contents, any loss of rent, any of those things directly associated with the, the unit owner themselves is not going to be covered under the um, under the master policy. One of the things that does cause some confusion sometimes is the maintenance section of the decks and bylaws often states that the unit owners are required to maintain their, their unit. That is a, a completely separate section from the insurance. So that doesn't apply in the insurance realm. Um, it, it goes back to the master policy being responsible for the as-built construction of the entire building, including the units. So then the HO6 policy is written and intended to cover what's called betterments and improvements. Anything that the unit owner has done beyond the original construction or the as-built construction. And again, that can be done over years um, by different unit owners. So it's, it's important to hopefully have an understanding of how that building was originally constructed. Uh, the unit owner, the HO6 policy then will cover any of the personal belongings or contents for the unit owner themselves. And then if they incur a loss of rent, uh, that would be picked up by the HO6 as well. Anthony mentioned uh, tenants being involved, non-unit uh, non owner occupied units. Um, that adds another whole layer to it. We won't get into any great detail of that, but the tenants items, the tenants contents, the tenants cost to have to move someplace. That's not covered under any of those policies. They need their own policy for that. So that's just to keep in mind if that occurs to understand that's a whole nother layer that gets added to the process. Next slide, please. please. So the AOAO adjuster, what do they do? Um, what's their role? So initially they're gonna get that claim. It's reported to the agent. It gets sent to the insurance company and adjusting company. The adjuster is going to make contact with the, the point of contact for the association. It's typically property manager, sometimes resident manager, 
but that's the, the point person, the point of contact for the adjuster. The, the, that communication with that person is, is key from the adjuster and, and, and going back and forth. They need the, the property manager's help to get access to those units, to get into those units, um, to try to get the incident report, to, to just investigate the claim. They, they need the help of the property managers to, to get that information, to share it. Um, so it's vitally important that they have good communication back and forth. The adjuster then inspects the damages um, if necessary. I confirm the coverage, review the policy, scopes all the damages, documents it. Sometimes that can be gathered from uh, like Premier Restoration, who's on site, take pictures and started the mitigation already. Uh, they confirm the cause of loss. Again, that's something that's typically going to be listed in the the uh, loss report or incident report created uh, by the, the resident manager or property manager. Um, and then hopefully try to establish what the as bills were. Um, now, if there's prior claims that have been handled, a lot of times they can just go back and look at those. Uh, but that's what the basis of their settlement needs to be on. So that's part of the process is determining that. Once all that's gathered and, and everything is reviewed and okayed, uh, the settlement of that or the, the finalization of that claim is then shared back with the property manager. It's then the property manager uh, or the AOAO, whoever the point person is, then distributes that information to the unit owners. The adjusters are not able to share all of that information with the different unit owners. It's, they are not technically the insureds on the policy uh, to be able to share that directly with them. So it all has to go to the property manager and then it all has to go, you know, be distributed however it's been set up with the AOAO on, you know, how that's gonna be spread out to the, to the unit owners. Um, and then the adjuster would review any subrogation, which is, is would, did somebody do something that they can go after? you know, was a contractor involved or something like that. It's also important to understand that typically the, the condominium documents, bylaws, declarations, there's typically a waiver of subrogation that keeps the association from going after a unit owner um, to try to collect. Uh, there are ways to, and Keen will talk about the deductible, but as far as going after them because they're at fault or something like that, usually that's not possible from the association to the unit owner. Next slide, please. The HO6 adjuster, they have a couple of extra steps that they need to take uh, because they first need to figure out if the AOAO adjuster or the AOAO itself has filed a claim, what the status of that claim is, what they're paying for, um, to, to be ordered to evaluate what may need to be addressed under the HO6 policy. So there's a step that they've got to take as far as has a claim been filed, um, in addition to still finding out all of the other information, what caused the loss, what's been done, has mitigation started, all of that investigation still needs to happen on the HO6 as well. They'll do the same process as far as get, gathering all the loss information, scope of damages, and then their estimate if there is a, a claim set up with the association would really just be to address anything beyond what the association is paying for the as built. So it would be the cost difference between that laminate countertop and the marble uh, or the vinyl floor and the tile, whatever may have been upgraded. Uh, and then they'll, they'll work that out. Hopefully they can get that information from the either the property manager or the, the association directly. And then they share that settlement with the, the unit owner themselves. They also will address the personal property damage, the loss of use that may be incurred uh, on the unit owner themselves. Um, contents becomes an issue between the master policy and the uh, unit owner because if the damage is severe, the contents sometimes have to get moved out. Typically, that's going to fall on the HO6 policy to cover the cost of packing, moving, storing all those items. Um, if, if it's not severe, usually the association estimate will include kind of shuffling the furniture around, contents around to, to make the repairs. But once it becomes a big event, and things have to be moved out and stored, it goes back to the HO6 carrier. Um, so then all of that information is shared with the owner. That adjuster will again look for, hey, do we have anybody? Was anybody at fault? Can we go after anybody? Um, and there is typically not a waiver of subrogation keeping unit owners from going after another unit owner if they feel they're responsible. 
the important thing here though to remember is just because the water originated from somebody else's unit doesn't make that other unit responsible for their damages uh, it's if they were unaware of the leak occurring if they didn't play any role in causing it to happen um, it's most likely not going to be covered under their liability policy because they didn't do anything wrong and it would just fall back under the ho6 of the unit owner that received the damage okay i think that's it for that section keen back to you all right thanks okay this you know the situation that uh mike had mentioned this is an ideal situation where both the master policy carrier and the ho6 carriers you know deal with all the um all what was involved and they work together. Um, you know, you're not gonna always uh, see this kind of uh, participation uh, in all of the carriers, but uh, this is uh, ideally what we would like to see. Next slide, please. Okay, now what happens if the association declines to file the claim? You have no master policy to deal with, and the as built, uh, you know, for the common property. In the two examples that we provided, you know, uh, it's likely that the HO6 carriers will continue to handle the entire claim, uh, subject to the individual unit owner's deductible in uh, each unit. But each policy will send a demand letter at the conclusion of the claim to the association and ask for reimbursement. You know, one of the questions we often receive is what if the loss is below the association's deductible? Or what if the loss is above the deductible? The association is still responsible for that deductible, like any insured would be. But the association has the option to do uh, a special assessment, you know, up to their deductible as outlined in the statute, which we will cover in a later slide. The balance over the deductible should be handled by the master policy, what Mike had uh, discussed earlier. You know, another common question from the property managers is, is it, a, is it good practice for the association to decline to report the claim? This is definitely not a good practice. This may generate lawsuits, claims issues for the association for late reporting, potential issues for causing prejudice and cost escalation, or even having the unit owner suing for insufficient limits to cover both the as-built and their improvements combined. We also have seen lawsuits against the individual board members for not wanting to report these claims. It is best to let the master policy provide scope of what should be covered under their policy and work out other issues with the HO6 carriers and vendors on the mitigation and repairs. Next slide, please. Deductible assessment. Remember that $5,000 association deductible? It is still outstanding, which needs to be collected in order to pay everyone and to make everyone whole. This association's deductible is an item that continues to be a mystery or thorn in our side uh, to many of us. Earlier, we provided two claim scenarios. The association board in scenario number one, where there was clear liability, would likely assess the deductible to the responsible party or the source unit. In scenario number two, where the liability is unclear, the deductible is the responsibility of the association to decide how that deductible should be handled. So now what? Who is responsible for that deductible? What can the property manager association board do? Next slide, please. The association board really needs to follow HRS 514B 143D to make the decision as to how they want to assess the deductible and this understanding should be consistent and shared with all the unit owners. If the board is still unclear as to and cannot agree, they should consult with their association attorney uh, for, to give them help and guidance. This statute gives the board three possible options. Here is what the statute contemplates in very simple terms. Option number one. 
the association pays the deductible. Option number two, the association assesses the deductible to the source unit. Or option number three, the association splits the deductible among the affected units. I can tell you from experience that this is the least chosen option and it is the most likely, the most problematic and controversial given the innocence of the affected units. So who is responsible for making all of this happen? The association board with the guidance of their property manager and the association's attorney should address this issue in advance and be prepared to make a consistent decision based on the source and cause. The insurance agents and the insurance adjusters do not make this decision for the association. Let me repeat that. This is really important. It is not the insurance agent or the insurance adjuster to make the decision for the board, okay? So if option one was chosen by the board where they choose to pay the deductible as a common expense, you can pay it and move, move forward and move to the claim ex, uh, expense step, uh, claim settlement step. If option number two or number three is taken, you're gonna to have to send the uh, assessment letter or the letter explaining option three and make the collection and move to the claim settlement step. Brandon will give you uh, some additional information and tools at the closing of this seminar to better handle the decision-making process. So now let's move to the claim settlement practice. We're almost there. Next slide, please. Claim settlement check. Finally, you get the claim settlement check. The settlement letter along with the settlement check generally is mailed uh, to the mailing address on the policy, which in most cases uh, is the managing agent or the property manager for the association. The letter will include a breakdown of all the repairs and the remediation costs for each unit and the policy deduct uh, less the policy deductible. So property managers, it is your responsibility to issue the settlement checks to all the affected units. So it was very important for you to understand and really understand that settlement letter. So you have a clear understanding as to how much each unit is entitled to. This is also where the association board's decision on how the deductible will be handled comes into play. The property manager has to decide based on the decision of the board how the application of the deductible is to be done. Property managers don't delay, process the payments as soon as possible to prevent further delays in repairs. And the further delays in repairs could mean that, you know, the H06 policy will have to pay more in additional living expense. Uh, this could be problematic. Under the H06 checks, uh, those are normally sent directly to the unit owner the mortgage holder, or it could be even the vendors directly. The association or the property manager is not involved in this portion as it may involve payments for contents, loss of use, or additional living expenses, or loss of rent uh, if it's a rental unit. So, uh, you know, property manager, you don't have to worry about this portion. Next slide, please. Okay, here is a typical letter that uh, Mike will cover in greater detail. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Keen. This is a, a typical letter. We're going to get to the estimate section next uh, that hopefully you should be receiving on um, all of your master policy claims. Uh, and we'll just review it quickly. There's a couple of areas to highlight. So the, the letter is going to outline the settlement and it should outline it in two ways. One, in, in a total, like this is the total amount of the loss less your deductible. If you look on the first page, uh, it lists, here's the summary of the building. So that's the total of everything uh, that's been established, replacement cost value, less any depreciation that's been applied uh, for the repair portion, and then less the deductible, and here's the total amount. And then it should summarize, if a claim is made for that recoverable depreciation, this is the total that the association is going to receive for disbursement. Uh, so we understand that 
that the property managers need a breakdown. Um, and so we, the adjusters should be, and I qualify that with should be because I understand it doesn't always happen. Um, but the goal is to have the letter sent out with a clear breakdown of the costs per unit, both mitigation and repairs per unit. So on the second page on the right hand side, you'll see it's highlighted in the red box where each unit is listed. In this scenario, it breaks the uh, RCV, the, the replacement cost value down for each unit, lets you know what the depreciation amount for each unit is, and then the actual cash value amount. So that actual cash value amount less the $500 deductible should total the check payment that was received. And this should assist in the distribution of the funds. It should be spelled out clearly. Um, we do get calls from time to time where, hey, how does this get distributed? And sometimes the letter doesn't doesn't outline it clearly enough. Uh, sometimes it does, and the letter just wasn't forwarded from whoever got the mail to the person who's handling the check. Uh, the next thing that the the letter will should cover is if there is anything that's not covered, the letter should outline that. For instance, the plumbing repairs are under any commercial policy and most homeowner policies. If it just breaks and leaks, it's not covered. Um, and then the the letter should explain that with, hey, by the way, the plumbing isn't covered and here's the portion of the policy that explains why it's not covered. Uh, and then all of that should be spelled out very clearly. Uh, next slide, please. Then the estimate that is provided should also give the breakdown. So in this case, and the estimate can look at one of two ways, um, depending on what was received and, and what the settlement is based on. In this case, we received estimates from Premier Restoration for both the mitigation for the units as well as the repairs for the units. So the adjuster's role in that process is to then review those documents, review the scope, make sure there's nothing overlapping uh, in regard to, hey, they pulled the carpet out in the mitigation process. Let's make sure they didn't do it again in the repair process. Just double checking those items to make sure it's all uh, straightforward and, and it makes sense. Uh, and provided all those are legitimate and look good, they'll they'll do provide an estimate like this, which is what it's called. We refer to as a summary estimate, and it's unit by unit, and it lists a premier's estimate for mitigation was this amount, the reconstruction was this amount, it lists the depreciation, and it should correspond with what's on that letter. And again, take it unit by unit, um, as is as you'll see that's highlighted in yellow on the screen. Next slide, please. And then again, it should outline this, the summary for the building total. So those units all together, total, the grand total, less the depreciation that was applied for all the units, less your deductible. We typically will not apply a deductible to a specific unit on the estimate as Keen had mentioned, that's really deferred to the association on how they're gonna handle that. So it's just subtracted from the total payment. And then it's up to the AOAO or property manager however it's been established to apply that. Keen, back to you. All right, so property managers, please note the detail of this letter and the breakdown of, for each of the units. If you don't get that from your adjuster, from your association's adjuster, you need to ask them for clarification so you can properly issue the payments. Uh, note again, the deductible is taken on the gross amount uh, it's not broken out by each individual. So it's essential that the property managers understand what the board has uh, made a decision on as to how to take the deductible. Uh, thank you, Mike, for an excellent presentation. Next slide, please. Our next speaker is Brandon Keenan. He is the AOAO Business Development Manager at Atlas Insurance, and he has 17 years of insurance experience in the insurance industry. I'm sorry. Uh, Brandon will go over some key takeaways uh, for today's seminar. Brandon, take it away. Thank you, Keen. So uh, one other thing to point out uh, again is if you have any other questions for our claims adjusters, please don't forget to type those in the Q&A box. So we're including a step-by-step -step, uh, matrix in our webinar today as one of the takeaways. Can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. And 
you know, it answers the age old who, what, where, and when things should be happening along the way. So that if your claim seems stalled, you'll know where to pick up the process to get it moving again. As we had heard earlier, every association should have a claims process in place. This will certainly assist in being sure that the claims process flows as smoothly as possible. Keen talked about the assessment of the deductible. How is this done? We're also including in a sample assessment letter that you can use and refine as you see fit. It's one we offer to our existing clients and we think you will find it very useful since per 514B statute, there are certain requirements when assessing the deductible. A point that we briefly have touched upon earlier regarding the choices that are available in assessing the deductible. As board members come and go, you wanna have a consistent process in place to avoid any potential lawsuits for being accused of showing any kind of favoritism, whether intentional or not. We suggest that you have your association attorney draft a resolution for your specific community as all associations are unique and we're not lawyers, so we don't have a draft, but we certainly can assist in reviewing your resolution and possibly providing uh, some sample wording. So with that having been said, uh, we're gonna open up for questions and answers. And uh, so back to you, Della. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Keen. Thank you, Anthony and Mike. Uh, great presentation, everyone. Okay, so we're going to get right into Q&A. Um, if we're going to try to cover as many questions, we did receive um, questions during registration, and then we re also received some questions at, um, during the seminar. So if we don't get to your question, please um, do reach out to us and we'll answer your question for you. Okay, first question. This question is for you, Keen. Have you ever encountered a claim denial and what steps did you take to mitigate the denial? Thank you, Della. Well, being on the agency side, I am an advocate for the insured. Um, I look for what the adjuster may have missed or give the adjuster another perspective to see the loss and give him reasons as to why it should be covered. Uh, this way, you know, we have a very positive outcome for all the insurers, the agency and the insurance carrier, because you have everyone that's, uh, you know, happily paid. Um, a good example of this is uh, I was brought in to uh, review a loss. The, uh, you know, adjusters had denied the claim. I took a look at it. Uh, I gave the insurance you know, the uh, adjuster another perspective because it was a drain blockage. I gave him uh, the wording. I gave him a different perspective on the statute. And uh, I was able to help the insured in that uh, way by getting the adjuster to uh, reverse himself and covering the loss in total. Thank you. Thank you, Keen. Okay, this question, I'm going to ask Mike to answer first. And then after that, I want to ask Anthony the same question. What are issues that could hold up the process of a claim? What are issues? Uh, there could be multiple issues. There's a lot of moving parts as we've outlined in the presentation. Um, Anthony did a good job of explaining just the difference between cat one and cat three or something involving uh, environmental controls. So you see the big delay between a clean water and a, and a cat three loss, just the time it's gonna take. Uh, what it, it, there could be a situation where materials aren't available um, and, you know, things that are just naturally going to occur because these are not planned events. Nobody, you know, plans on a water pipe breaking and having to replace things. So there's, there's things that could delay it that are legitimate and, and reasonable. And those things need to be uh, communicated and explained clearly throughout the process. Um, so everybody's just aware of what's going on and so that people aren't just, um, have this expectation that, oh, this should be done by now and not understand why. Um, from the adjusting point, there could be, again, multiple items. Can we get access to all the units? And that's, that's where the property managers or resident managers are vital for our adjusters to help get us in so we can evaluate the loss. 
Um, have we gotten all the information yet from the contractors? Are they done yet? Um, and, and all those things need to be gathered. So there's a lot of those type of things that, that can cause delays, but ultimately the communication and the cooperation between all the parties involved is kind of the key to making sure things go smoothly and efficiently. And it really starts with the adjuster from the, the start of the claim, explaining the process, explaining what's needed uh, to both the property manager, to the contractors on site, um, so we get the right information the first time and we don't have to, you know, do extra follow-ups or anything like that. And then again, it goes to the cooperation of property managers and whatever vendors involved, um, getting us the information, getting us access to the sites. Um, so there's a lot, again, a lot of moving parts and, um, the communication and cooperation is key to making sure it goes as efficiently as possible. Anthony, Anthony, anything else? Yeah, I think for me, it's um, it's like the lack of information and lack of understanding in the process. If I had to distill it down to kind of one or two key issues, because as you mentioned, Mike, it's, it's kind of like there's a list of like 50 different reasons why things can stall. And base, if you go from, you know, job to job, claim to claim, it's like, all right, which one's going to pop up and rear its ugly head on us today? Is it going to be the tenant's issue? Is it going to be the, you know, the as-built as versus betterment and improvement? Um, so if I, if I had to answer the question more directly, uh, I'm, a, I'm a property manager or a resident manager. What can I do to make sure that things go smooth and things go fast? Um, I always kind of go back to, call as soon as you see an event, you know, get, get a remediation company. Like, even if it's not me, call somebody else, get them involved early because there's a lot that we can do to save building materials out of the box. And we lose the ability to save those building materials every single day that goes past. And I, I feel like folks focus on figuring out whose fault it was first. Um, and in doing that, inevitably cause more damage and more delay. And I know it's unintentional. I know most folks are pretty well intentioned on this stuff, but that would be the one thing I would say, Tella. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, third question. Why is it that many boards, management companies and managers make you deal with your neighbors to work out the details when there is a water intrusion that involves multiple units. Many times they will put, put it through the AOAO's master policy and tell you to deal with the source directly or contact your own insurance directly. So this question is for Mike and Keen, if you have anything to add to it. The, so the answer is, we would prefer that not to happen from the claim side. We would prefer that the AOAO uh, get involved from day one. Um, there's there are situations where um, I think we might talk about it this question later. Like the they don't expect it. You may not expect it to exceed the deductible. So you don't want to put um, that claim in because it may not you know exceed the the master policy deductible. So um, it's vitally important that the AOAO gets involved right right away. Uh, gets mitigation started. You know, we've outlined who's ultimately responsible and the association is responsible for the as builts. So it's very important that they get involved right away and not just defer it to the unit owners. Keen? No, I'm in uh, total agreement. I think you, you said it all. Thank you. Okay, this question is for Anthony. How do you determine salvageability? And do you use a user-friendly guide for consumers? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the time, salvageability boils down to the, they call it the porosity of the building material. How porous is it? And then what was the, um, the level of contamination in the water that that building materials came in contact with? So if it's very porous and very dirty, we're likely going to have to remove it. Whereas if it was, maybe not so porous, but very dirty, you know, there's a possibility we can save it. Whereas if it's very clean and very not porous, i.e. clean water loss, tile floors, universally can be saved. So as a, as a general guideline for everybody, um, 
those are kind of your two slides on the scale, so to speak. One of the things that we did is we put together a um, material salvageability guide. Originally, it was a document that we put together for our internal staff, so our claims coordinators, when they're on the phone and somebody's like, can you save my laminate floor? They could go, yes, no, maybe, you know, they kind of had a guide. And then we ended up um, including it in our CE class materials, and now it's actually a part of, like, our general marketing materials as a how to um, determine things. So uh, we'll make that available as well. I think that you guys are going to send that out, right, Della? Yes. Yes, we will. Thank you. Awesome. And then it also gives you, uh, I, I saw another question in here. It also gives you um, how do you determine category of water, category one, two, three. There's a definitive guide on determining category of water in there as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This question is for Mike. How does depreciation work? So depreciation, just to, to give a quick definition of what it is, it's basically the adjustment made to get the cost to reflect the current condition of the item. So for instance, we'll apply depreciation. It's typically applied based on age and condition of an item. So for flooring, you know, we'll plug it in for the carpet was five years old. So it's going to apply depreciation to that material to get it to a point that it should reflect the carpet that's in the, the unit at the time of the loss is worth X amount. Um, the most policies for the, the master policy are what's called a replacement cost policy, meaning that the depreciation that's withheld from the original payment is available once the work is done, provided that they've incurred the cost. So provided that the cost of making those repairs was basically a, above the actual cash value settlement. So the, the trick here though, is because the way it typically works with the association dispersing the funds, it's, it almost needs to come with an explanation to the unit owner that, hey, this, this amount is available once the work is complete and you need to notify us, provide us with the paid invoices so, they, so we can get it. So then it can be forwarded back to the insurance company for uh, evaluation. And just from experience, that's not done. Um, it's maybe done 50% of the time that we get a claim back on depreciation for the unit owners. Um, and we'll send out a reminder letter typically, hey, this is to remind you we issued this payment with X amount of depreciation withheld. Let us know if you're gonna make a, a claim for it. Um, and if we don't get a response, the file just gets closed. Okay, thank you. Um, one addition that I would like to make is um, that's why it's good to have an advocate on your side uh, for the insurance, uh, someone like me, uh, because when the application of the depreciation, depreciation is done, uh, I will sometimes uh, step in and ask the adjuster to adjust the depreciation to make sure that they only adjust the depreciation on the material costs and not the cost of the labor. So generally depreciation should be done or betterment should be done only on the cost of the materials and not the labor rate to install it. Thanks. Thank you, Keen. Okay, next question is for Mike and Keen, if you want to add. How does the policy handle asbestos abatement? Um, any limits problem? And could this fall under building ordinance? So the asbestos question comes up a lot. And the first thing that's that's important for the board and the property manager is to review the policy uh, because typically the, the most policies that we handle do, do not have an exclusion for asbestos. There are some that have an endorsement that excludes anything, any cost related to asbestos, uh, whether it's testing, cleanup, reconstruction of anything necessary because of asbestos. Uh, it is just not covered. It's not covered under ordinance. It is just not covered anywhere. Uh, and then other policies, some will, may have a, a, an endorsement that limits coverage. It's going to pay up to X amount for asbestos. Uh, but the majority of the ones we handle, you know, DB insurance, we handle a lot for, they typically don't have an endorsement that limits or excludes the asbestos. So it's not addressed under any ordinance or law coverage. It's just included in part and coverage of the building. Um, and it's the, the things to remember are it's, it's only what's related to the loss. So it doesn't open the door to, hey, we're gonna abate, you know, seven units when two are affected or even other rooms. It's just going to be to abate the affected areas. 
Uh, and then again, that's usually incorporated into um, the, the estimates provided by the experts, like from Anthony from Premier, they would send a separate estimate for, hey, this is what the abatement is gonna cost. So it's all separated out. Um, and again, that's typically the way it works. So the important thing it goes back to, does the policy exclude it or limit it? And then if not, it's just a matter of documenting, hey, these are the affected areas, did they test hot? And the and it's, it's another thing again, and, and Anthony may be able to add some light to it that can cause delays because they have to test for that if the building's past a certain age, whatever that might be, so. Yeah, Thanks, I'll, uh, I'll kick in oh, on that. Go ahead. The, yeah, so the internal policy for Premier Restoration is uh, buildings old, younger or older than 1985 are typically more suspect for asbestos containing materials. So that's the threshold that we've established in our baselining. We haven't found a building 86 or newer that has had any asbestos. Um, and then the other thing on delays. So if we're removing 16 linear feet or 160 square feet of asbestos containing material, uh, we have to notify the state of Hawaii Department of Health and give them a 10 day notification. And so a lot of the times that's where the delays come on asbestos. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing to remember is, you know, uh, property managers and associations of older buildings, um, you really got to take a look at the policy. And even if the policy does not cover asbestos removal or abatement, um, it is still going to be the cost of the association. So. I've had uh, several come up in uh, recent uh, months that the association, because uh, there is no coverage for asbestos, is gonna be stuck with a $50,000 additional bill on top of the deductible. So it's very problematic. So make sure you have uh, uh, asbestos included, uh, especially for the older buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this question is for Mike. Why do I have to have an incident report? We touched on this a little bit earlier. The incident report is hugely helpful for the adjuster. Um, you know, their first step is to investigate, answer the, the who, what, why, where, when, how did this all happen? What occurred since it happened? Um, you know, is there anybody at fault? Did somebody leave the water run? Was mitigation taken place? All of those things are typically outlined in a good incident report or, or even just a basic one. Like it, it outlines when the association was notified or when the resident manager or whoever is the contact was notified, what they did, what steps were taken. It's just, it answers so many of the questions for the adjuster um, that it, very quickly. So it's very easy. And if we can get that, like when the claim is submitted, so it comes from the agent to our office, if that's already in the attachments that we receive, that just expedites the investigation process, you know, very quickly. So hugely yes. important. Yeah, thank you. And we did cover that in the claim notification process, how important it is to complete it as at the time of loss, because it is, it is more accurate than when you complete it weeks later. Um, this question is again for you, Mike. When reporting a water leak to your HO6 carrier, the H HO6 claims adjuster does a physical inspection of your unit. In what circumstances would warrant the association's claims adjuster to not perform an on-site inspection, but rather complete a telephone interview with the resident manager? The short answer is the COVID pandemic. Um, that has been occurring much more often uh, with the, especially with the, the association, the master policy claims. Uh, and the reason for that is typically they involve uh, a water leak and typically they involve, they've already gotten the process going. So if somebody like premieres on site and has already started the mitigation and has taken pictures and documented the loss, we can get all the information that we need from the vendors on site. Um, they do, you know, sometimes Premier will do a, a video deal where you can get in and look at all the damage and take measurements and everything. It's spectacular. So it's, it's the virtual inspection using those methods is very effective. There are times where we will, you know, it warrants us to, to do an inspection. We don't mind doing that, but 
in light of the current you know covid climate we are trying to handle more over the phone to try to get that information the ho6 unit owner sometimes they have different you know we've talked about what each policy covers and if there's a lot of contents damage if they need to determine if the, the place is livable or not for uh, loss of use sometimes an adjuster has to go look at their contents and get all that documented because it's too much to have the unit owner themselves do so um, we like to inspect our field adjusters would much rather inspect than not uh, but lately again the mandate's been try to get the information over the phone if possible thank you Okay, this question again is going to be for Mike. Um, what if the remediation company is asking for a deposit for their work? Several units involved in this case. Um, who pays the um, who pays for the remediation company's deposit? AOAO or unit owners? I think we covered this. Yeah, we, we may have. I would recommend that the AOAO step in again and take control of the situation. Um, and just to back up a little bit, you probably, when there is not a, a loss occurring, is to, to talk to multiple uh, restoration companies to find out who's going to charge you for a response and who's not going to charge you for a response. Typically, if they know there's insurance involved and it's a pipe leak, they won't make people pony up the 50% the deposit or whatever it may be. Um, you know, before they show up and work because they understand something's got to happen quickly. Uh, but again, we would put it to the association. If it's a covered loss, that mitigation is going to get included in the, the estimate from the contractor to the insurance company and provided it's covered would be reimbursed. So we would recommend the AOAO take charge. Thank you. Okay. This question is for you, Anthony. What are the criteria or definitions of category one, two, and three water intrusion? So I'll, uh, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> this is a dangerous <laughs> question to ask me. Okay, we don't have much time uh, left. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll distill it down. So category one, like, so if you just said category one, clean, category two, gray, category three, dirty, um, or the the definitions that I like to use are category one can drink it. Nothing bad will ever happen to you from drinking category one water, category two water. You can drink it, but it won't kill you. Um, it'll probably give you an upset stomach. You <laughs> might end up in the hospital. You might have to take some drugs, but you're going to be fine. Category three could kill you. It could give you, you know, any pathogen, Ebola, AIDS, anything gnarly that's floating around in the sewer system. Um, category three is really the stuff you want to stay away from. And if you have questions on how the category impacts salvageability, again, you guys will be all be getting that salvageable guide. Um, yeah, take a look at it. It's been a huge tool for us internally. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, Keen, this question is for you. What okay. if the unit owner does not have an HO6 policy? Boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> You know, the, uh, the experience that I've uh, gone through, the associations have just assessed the unit owner, uh, the uh, amount of up to the, you know, the amount of the deductible. And uh, I've known owners that had to just uh, pony up and pay that amount, whether it's 5,000, 10,000 or 25,000. So I've had uh, that happen in uh, on several occasions already. So um uh, it's uh that's that's not a good thing good thank you <clears throat> okay this is for mike um we've got about 10 minutes so there was an issue that unit owner did not report water leak claim then they contacted the management and board for request of payment unfortunately the owner did not turn over repair water leak timely and the cost escalated. Who is responsible for the escalated cost? Is it the case the AOAO was responsible? Yeah, it's a good I question uh, because it's it does come up from time to time that the, the claims aren't reported timely. If it, the water leak is contained just to that unit, nobody else is really aware if it's not leaking out or anything. Uh, it does present coverage questions because there, you know, the duties that, that Della had outlined the responsibility to take steps to mitigate the loss is on both policies. Um, 
on the association policy, it's it would still be a coverage issue, but most of the carriers are going to review that as you were not aware that the loss occurred. Um, so there was you're not at fault for any delay in reporting under your master policy. Uh, unfortunately, because most of the the declarations, the AOAO uh, bylaws el you know, eliminate the opportunity for the association to go after the unit owner. Sometimes they can't go back to them, but then they can review it for a possible assessment for any increase, uh, again, up to the deductible. But it's a, those are tricky ones because it doesn't need to be explained and presented to the insurance company by the adjuster. This was not a normal delay where they just sat on it and didn't do anything. Um, they weren't aware of the situation. That one's going to be really tough because if there was a significant uh, portion of time that has gone by, um, the policy may not respond because it's beyond the two-year statute limitations. Uh, that could be an issue. So it uh, depends on how you take a look at it. So it's uh, normally it's two years from the date of loss. So I, I think uh, a case that's reported significantly late is very, very problematic. Okay, speaking of uh, number of years, this one is a, uh, for you, Mike, and Keen, maybe if you wanna add, a water damage claim happened, or a water damage happened 10 years ago. Uh, the association did not file a claim. Today, the owner of the unit um, did not do any repair. Can the unit owner place a claim with the AOAO policy? I think Keen's last answer kind of addressed <laughs> the, the yeah. problematic right. issues yeah. with that after 10 years. The other thing to keep in mind is that if it happened 10 years ago, if it was even able to be filed past the two-year statute, it would have to go to whatever insurance policy, policy was in effect 10 years ago. So that would all, it might not even be the current insurance carrier of the building they would have to date back to whatever policy was in effect 10 years ago. So it is, that's the, the older they are, the more problematic they become. Yeah, I think I tend to agree with that one. Um, if it's uh, 10 years old, I think they're SOL. I mean, I, I think the statute of limitations has run and uh, they will have a problem in making any kind of collection. Yeah. If they can say it was a construction defect, they may stand a chance. Uh, Statute repose is 10 years from, you know, the, uh, that date. And uh, that would be maybe their only option. But uh, even contractually, statute limitations is six years. So um, it, I, I really think they, in all likelihood, would not be able to collect on that claim. Thank you. Um, Keen, this question is for you. Should the association pay the deductible while it waits for the deductible to be paid by the source unit? See, these are the kinds of questions that are really excellent questions. Yeah. So something like this, the board should make a decision uh, ahead of time. Are, is this something that we are going to do? And if it is, then they should consistently do it because you can't do it for one claim and not do it for the other. So if as a general practice and um, condition, uh, you know, part of your resolution or whatever your uh, soaps that uh, you are going to pay it um, and collect the deductible on the back end. Uh, this is that's that would be excellent because you could speed up the process. I think the H06 carriers would be happy because you can make everyone whole. It would limit the uh, additional living expense exposure or the loss of rent. So I think uh, something like this would be beneficial to all and uh, speed up the claims process. Thank you. Okay, this question is for Keen and Mike. Just to clarify, if the source unit causes damage to another unit, the source unit is not responsible for the damage to the other unit or does it depend on the source unit's HO6 or is it accident versus neglect? Okay, this is a yeah, kind so, of a... <laughs> so it goes just because what the, the definition or, or I guess the interpretation of causes the damage. The water 
originating, the leak originating from, say, the unit above in this situation um, is not automatically the fault of that unit owner. So under the association policy, you just it, it should really just be understood that if a water leak occurs, the association is responsible for the as-built condition of the building. Uh, it then becomes between the unit owners because the unit owner below would need to determine <clears throat> what caused the leak above and are they responsible? So the unit, if the, say it was the unit owner left the water run and left the building, that is causing the damage, that's negligence. The exposure from the HO6 below may be able to collect from the unit owner above's liability for their damages. So maybe for the betterments, maybe for contents, but if it's just a pipe, a you know toilet seal leaks that happens all the time, pipe in a wall breaks, drain line gets clogged and backs up within the wall, there's there's no insurance, no HO6 of the source unit owner is going to pay for the resulting damage below on a liability basis because they didn't do anything wrong. There was no negligence there. I agree with Mike. Um, if there is no constructive notice, uh, if they had no idea that this loss would uh, occur. Um, but if the unit owner above was aware or was put on notice in a, for the prior condition, <clears throat> a good example would be um, uh, water heaters, uh, you know, being of age. If a newsletter went out to say, hey, everyone with uh, water heaters that are 10 years old and older, you need to replace them. And if they failed to do so, that would be constructive notice and that potentially could present a liability claim for the unit owner above because they failed to maintain what was their responsibility. So it really depends. If they can prove the unit owner below can prove legal liability, uh, they may have a chance against the unit owner above. Um, I think we're down to two minutes. So, you know, for those, thank you, gentlemen. For those of you that um, there, your questions did were not answered, please do reach out to us. Um, again, if you need a copy of the claims procedure matrix or sample loss assessment letter that um, Brandon had talked about, please contact Brandon Keenan or Sean Satterfield. Um, today's webinar is recorded, so all attendees will receive an email with a link to the webinar. Our next CCM seminar is on Friday, November 6th on Reserves 101. It's going to be hosted by CIT, formerly known as Mutual of Omaha Bank. On behalf of CCM and Atlas Insurance, I would like to thank our partners for their valuable contributions. Anthony Nelson and Premier Restoration, Mike Petruche and John Mullen and Company, and Keen Muranaka and Atlas Insurance. And to all of our attendees, thank you for your time. Take care and be safe. Aloha. Aloha, everyone. Thanks, Stella. You guys take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.